Hello everyone, welcome to Dinesh Kiwil. My name is Dinesh Priyankara, Microsoft MVP and IT consultant. Let's talk about Microsoft Fabric. You know that it was announced with Microsoft Build and we know that it was announced as a unified data analytics platform. So which means this is for implementing data solutions. We have been using various services tools given by Microsoft for implementing data solutions. Things like SQL Server and uh, Azure uh, services like Azure SQL Database and then Databricks, HD Insight and then Synapse. And what is this new platform, Microsoft Fabric? So let's explore it and let's try to understand the features, characteristics of Microsoft Fabric. And let me show you the way of uh, starting with the Microsoft Fabric trial. Remember, this video has been created using uh, Microsoft Fabric Preview. So the things I show you, things I discuss with this video might not be available as it is when you really work with Microsoft Fabric. All right, let me show you the agenda. So I'm going to show you a set of slides that explains how we have been implementing data solutions starting from on-prem to then cloud and then things like HD Insight, Databricks and Synapse. And then let's talk about the features of Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so once that discussion is done, I'm going to show you the way of starting with uh, Microsoft Fabric trial and let me take you through some of the features. Okay, so remember I'm not going into detail. I'll be creating a set of videos on uh, each of these features. This video is purely for introducing Microsoft Fabric. How we have been implementing data solutions. So let's talk about on-prem solutions first. So you know that uh, if, if you go back to 10, 15 years, we even not implementing things like uh, big data solutions or uh, machine learning solutions or data science solutions. We were simply focusing on data warehousing. So in order to create a data warehouse solutions, what we did was we access uh, multiple data sources and we were trying to handle requirements coming from uh, multiple types of uh, audience types like information consumers, power users, basic users. We, we were getting you know various type of business requirements when it's come to analysis and analytics, right? That's what we uh, experience. So we used to create a data repository called Data Warehouse using uh, you know concepts like Kimball's concept, Inman's concept, and uh, and most of the time it's going to be a dimensional model where you see facts and dimensions. So we extract data from these sources and then uh, we uh, load the data warehouse. Okay, and uh, when it's come to the services or the tools we use for implementing. Uh, a solution like this, basically SQL Server. So we use SQL Server database engines for creating the data warehouse and we use uh, SQL Server integration service for creating ETL solutions. In certain cases, we maintain file share as well because not everything can be simply uh, a place or uh, you know added to the data warehouse. So we maintain file shares uh, with certain set of files for uh, performing advanced analytics, okay? Uh, in addition to that, we used to create models. Uh, earlier, we used to call them as cubes. So we use Microsoft SQL Server Analysis Services for creating cubes. And when it's come to reporting, dashboarding, we use SQL Server Reporting Services. All right. And then the next part is all about uh, semi-structured and unstructured data. Initially, we did not focus on uh, semi-structured and unstructured data. But later, business wanted to have all these things as a part of their analytical stores. So we had to make sure that our solution simply uh, accesses semi-structured and unstructured data and then process and then make them available as a part of uh, the stores we have created for analytics. Okay, so we didn't have a sort of a uh, you know tool exists with SQL Server. So we had to use uh, open source uh, tools and services. So we started using Hadoop. So we process semi-structured and unstructured data using uh, Hadoop and then uh, we, we open that environment uh, as well as uh, the data warehouse for advanced analytics. So when it's come to information consumer, they were mainly consuming things that have been created or given by IT, something like ready-made reports uh, using uh, SQL Server reporting services. Power users, they try to do something uh, uh, advanced, so they use uh, things like Jupyter Notebook, Eclipse, so they connect with the data warehouse or the cubes or the file share or, or the HDFS for getting data into their environment and uh, uh, process data. And the basic user, basically they use self-service 
BI client tools like Power BI and Excel. And uh, you know, simply they, they, they have been consuming data coming from Data Warehouse and uh, let's say the models for creating their own uh, uh, models, reports and dashboard. Okay, so this is how we have been implementing uh, on-prem uh, solutions and then we move things into the cloud. So we started seeing various components available in the cloud and we started seeing a new component called Data Lake. And if you specifically talk about services we use in Azure, these are the, uh, the services we use. So we use Azure Data Lake for maintaining all type of data. Uh, initially, we didn't have something like this with on-prem unless you have used HDFS. Uh, but with this Azure uh, uh, Data Lake, we started storing all types of data in the data lake. Of course, you need to organize it. There are multiple types of architectures we can use for organizing content in the data lake. Uh, we had various type of layers like raw layer, curated, enriched, or the process uh, like finance, sales uh, sections. So likewise, we were maintaining multiple segments in the data lake. And not only that, we were maintaining multiple formats of data as well, like CSV, Parquet, uh, various type of formats. And we use Azure Data Factory for uh, implementing ETL solutions. So Data Factory pipelines were responsible for accessing the data sources and then getting data into cloud and then process using uh, uh, like external components. Uh, when I say external components, external to Data Factory. So something like HD Insights, something like Databricks for processing them. And then we used to place this process data again in the data lake. So when it's come to Data Warehouse, we use Azure SQL database for creating Data Warehouse if it is not going to be a very big Data Warehouse. Uh, and we, uh, we were using Azure SQL Data Warehouse for implementing very large Data Warehouses. So, but basically the source for the Data Warehouse was the Data Lake. Okay. On top of that, we used to build models either using uh, Microsoft Power BI or Analysis Service. So we were using all these services for implementing uh, data solutions. We had some challenges because we were using various components, various services. Uh, I'm not going to say these are not compatible uh, when it's come to uh, you know combining all those or integrating all these services into a single solution, but we had some challenges. But in order to uh, you know, make sure that we don't see much challenges and we see an unified environment, Microsoft gave us another platform which is really good for implementing all type of data solutions. So that's what we saw as Synapse, Microsoft Azure Synapse. So Synapse gives us a one single platform that contains most of the components we need for implementing data solutions. So we started seeing Synapse Pipeline, which is Azure Data Factory inside Synapse. So we don't need to go out uh, from Synapse for implementing ETL solutions. We were able to use uh, Synapse Pipeline for implementing our ETL solutions. And when it's come to data processing, Synapse has Spark as an inbuilt component. So we were, we were able to use Synapse Spark for processing data, whether it's structured, semi-structured or unstructured. We were able to use uh, the Synapse Sparks for processing uh, data. And we can simply have one or more uh, Data Lake accounts integrated with Data Lake. So we were able to get the data uh, organized in an efficient manner and then open this data set for developers, for business users, or for a data warehouse, or for machine learning experiments, managing all these things within Synapse. Okay, We started seeing Synapse uh, Power BI integration, but not fully. Up to some extent, we, we were managed to create uh, uh, models and then maintain uh, or the create and maintain reports inside Synapse, but not fully. For most of the cases, we had to go back to the Power BI service for uh, implementing certain things. Uh, we had to use Power BI desktop for implementing models. Uh, we had to use Power BI service for uh, handling uh, certain parts of the security and all. Uh, we had some challenges with Synapse as well, but the environment is really good. We have been using Synapse for uh, years for implementing uh, a solution related data. It can be a big data solution, data warehouse solutions, or it, it could be something related to data science as well. All right. If you really think about uh, the workloads we have been uh, handling uh, with 
uh, data solutions, specifically when we use uh, Synapse and other Azure services, okay, we're talking about data engineering, data science, uh, e-tailing, then the, the maintaining multiple repositories for uh, multiple types of files. It's all about multiple data lakes, okay, and the data warehousing and uh, modeling, reporting, business intelligence. These are the workloads we see when it's come to data solutions. So in modern world, we see now data solutions that needs all, all these types of workloads, okay? So when you have to implement a data solution addressing all these workloads, then you start seeing some challenges. I'll, I'll give you some example, for, uh, you know, let's talk about interfaces. So let's say our solution needs uh, uh, data warehousing and business intelligence. So in that case, in order to implement, uh, you know, things related to business intelligence, we have to use Power BI service. So it's completely a different environment. We might have to use Power BI desktop as well, but basically, uh, you know, completely a different service and different interface. And when it's come to data warehousing, you have to use Synapse Studio, or you might have to use Management Studio as well. So two different interfaces. So let's say you your team has been formed, uh, you know, with various type of roles. Some of some of the uh, the resources, some of the engineers are familiar with Synapse. Some of them are familiar only with Power BI. So they will experience some uh, challenges when it's come to you know working together. Think about another challenge: licensing. If you if your solution needs both Power BI and Synapse, then we are talking about two different type of licenses. All right. So the licensing strategy, what to be picked, what to be purchased, uh, that is not going to be an easy decision. Think about security. OK, uh, so in order to make sure that uh, everything is properly set up and you align with whatever the defined security strategy. OK, that's going to be a bit hard uh, to implement the same uh, security strategy with uh, multiple services, Power BI, Synapse, and you might be using something like Event Hub. Or IoT Hub and Stream Analytics. So security is not going to be managed in a, in a central manner. So you might have to work with multiple components for implementing uh, things related to authentication and authorization. It's going to be a big challenge. Think about data governance. So your data is here and there. You know, some of the data sets are in Power BI service. Some of the data sets are in a dedicated SQL pool. And set of data is in data lake, OK? So how are we going to make sure that uh, you simply handle data governance with all these uh, multiple repositories? Of course you can do, but the thing is you might have to repeat all these uh, the practices with multiple repositories. That's going to be a, another challenge. So likewise, there are multiple challenges even if you use a platform like Synapse. Why we see these challenges? Because now the requirement is getting more and more complex. Business needs more and more things from a, a, a data solution, okay? So how do we handle these challenges? So we need a new unified environment. Of course, Synapse is a unified environment, but we started seeing challenges. So in order to handle these challenges, we need another environment. And that's why we have to use Microsoft Fabric. So the Microsoft Fabric is a unified data analytics platform, which can be used for implementing your data solution minimizing the challenges we experience with other platform and other services. So what is Microsoft Fabric? It is basically a combination of three things we have been using for implementing data solutions, Power BI, Synapse, and Data Factory. So we know that Power BI is basically used for business intelligence. We use Power BI for creating uh, data models and reports and dashboard and some other things with analytics, okay? And then uh, we use Data Factory for getting data from one environment to another environment. We will be doing some transformations in between. That's the usage of Data Factory. And the Synapse is basically used for data warehousing, data engineering, and data science as well. So the Microsoft Fabric has been formed using components, functionalities, or the tools in these three uh, uh, services, okay? And then it is available as a single platform. So it is a single AI-powered platform for all type of data, you know, all team members, okay? Uh, so the team members might be coming from data science team, data engineering team, business intelligence team. So it is for everyone. 
And not only that, the, the challenges we discuss can be simply handled on the address with Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so it has multiple components for uh, implementing the workloads we discuss. Okay, and I have listed out some of the, uh, the components or the functionalities. So the Power BI is available as a part of uh, Microsoft Fabric. Data Factory is available as a, a part of Microsoft Fabric for implementing your ETL solutions. And if you are planning a big data or data warehousing, you can simply use Synapse Data Engineering and Data Warehousing functionalities within Fabric. Okay. And uh, the data science and real-time analytics uh, type of implementation. Yes, you can simply implement those within Microsoft Fabric. Okay. What sort of interface I'm going to see with Microsoft Fabric? Am I going to see Microsoft Fabric Studio or Synapse Studio or Power BI uh, interfaces? We know that when it comes to all these interfaces, Power BI interface is the most, uh, how would I say, uh, most user-friendly interface. Or I can say uh, developer-friendly interface as well. Okay, so the Microsoft Fabric is within that interface. You are not going to uh, use a different URL for accessing Microsoft Fabric. You will be simply using the same URL, powerbi.com for accessing Microsoft Fabric. So what you're going to see is the familiar interfaces. If you have worked with Microsoft Power BI, you are well familiar with the interfaces given with Microsoft Power BI. So which means you will be able to implement all these uh, uh, solutions with the workloads we discussed using these components within Microsoft Fabric without struggling much. Right. Now, another component we have to discuss when it's called Microsoft Fabric, okay, which is the most important one related to Microsoft Fabric is one leg. So what is one leg? You can simply consider it as the foundation for Microsoft Fabric. Everything is based on or everything is connected to one leg. Okay, so what is one leg? It is, uh, in simple term, it is, it is a data repository. Okay, it is a data lake. Okay, you, you have worked with data lake and you are familiar with data lake. So it is data lake, but it has more, uh, you know, enhanced features. Now, I'm sure that everyone has worked with or use Microsoft OneDrive. So you, uh, you know, use OneDrive for uh, storing data, sharing data, and you basically maintain, uh, uh, you know, shared folders, and you, you do not go to the site for accessing the, uh, the file stored. You, you'd be simply using your file explorer in your machine, okay? So that's the usage of OneDrive. And you're going to see all these features with one leg as well. So one leg is a data lake, or you can consider as a one, uh, one drive, okay? But consider it is as a centralized data repository for all the items available in Microsoft Fabric, okay? So you'll be maintaining your data with one leg. You can, you can simply get it organized. So whenever you create a Microsoft Fabric tenant, one leg is getting automatically created, and you will be having your uh, segments or the layers. Now, you will be having your own workspaces. So you, then you have a section for your workspace. Within that workspace, you can create lake houses. And within those lake houses, you can create folders, subfolders, and files. Okay. And just like the way you have been accessing OneDrive using your file explorer, you can access one lake uh, using your file explorer in your machine. Okay. You have to download one lake explorer and install into your machine. After that, you'll be seeing one lake all the lake houses, uh, the folders, subfolders, files, uh, based on the permission you have, right? You're not going to see the entire one lake, okay? Or you will be seeing only permitted one, but you'll be seeing all these things just like the way you have been seen uh, uh, OneDrive folders, okay? And not only that, you can make modification to your files using the file explorer. You can add new files, okay? You can take copies of existing files into your machine. So this is how you access one leg, all right? Think about the security, uh, you know, authentication and authorization. So if I'm the admin, I'll be able to simply handle all the things related to security with one leg because everyone maintains their data with one leg. So I can simply manage, uh, I can simply implement my strategy with one leg for handling uh, the security or the authentication and authorization, okay? Not only that, data governance is really easy. Why? I'm not going to see multiple repositories. Everything is in one lake. 
So the things related to data governance can be easily implemented or handled or addressed with one leg. So these are the facilities you get with one leg. Few more things related to one leg. If you're going to work with one leg, if you're going to maintain files, you are free to use your own format, like CSV file, parquet files, anything is, any, any file format is okay with one leg, okay? But remember, basically one leg maintains all these, uh, you know, all, all your data as delta table. So when everything is maintained as de delta table, it can be open access or view by almost all tools you have seen or you have used for uh, implementing your data solution okay it is not limited to microsoft fabric of course like you know everything in microsoft fabric now for example uh, let's say uh, the data warehouse components in microsoft fabric data warehouse can be can simply access uh, delta tables and those tables can be simply open for business users and if someone wants to access uh, your one lake uh, data okay uh, not through the Microsoft Fabric, using some other tool, some other service. Yes, these can be simply accessed and all the files can be open uh, just like the way you have uh, open uh, your data lake files. Okay, so uh, you know how to access data lake files through APIs and SDKs, right? And the same thing can be done with one lake files. So if you are going to create warehouses, lake house or data sets or custom DBs, so everything is going to be based on delta tables and those can be simply accessed through TSQL or the Spark components or KQL ANSYS services or things outside the Microsoft Fabric easily. Okay, now see uh, the serverless compute. Now, if you want to access uh, data in your one lake using TSQL or using a notebook based on some Spark codes, okay, Python codes or Scala codes, you don't, you don't need to create clusters. This is serverless compute environment. Whenever you access your data through, an, for example, let's say notebook, the cluster will be automatically created for you, okay? And then you will be using it. Once the your experiment is done, it will be automatically shut down. So you don't need to worry about maintaining clusters. So this is how we see Microsoft Fabric, okay? There are much more things to be discussed as a part of Microsoft Fabric. Since this video is all about introducing, uh, you know, Microsoft Fabric, uh, I don't want to discuss other things in detail. Okay, so in simple terms, what is Microsoft Fabric? All-in-one analytics solutions. So it's an AI-powered platform for, uh, you know, implement all type of workloads we discuss. All right, and everything is based on one leg. That's the foundation for all the services. And the interface is going to be PowerBI.com. You're not going to use any other interfaces. You'll be using user-friendly powerbi.com for implementing solution related to all your workloads. All right, now let's quickly have a look on Microsoft Fabric. So we know that it is still uh, not fully available, but we can we can actually have a look using the, uh, the trial, okay? So if you have Power BI account, you don't need to have pro account. Even if you have free account, you can simply try this out. You can simply uh, check Microsoft Fabric, okay? So if you do not have an account, go and create a Power BI free account, all right? So what you have to do is you just visit powerbi.com or the visit app.fabric.microsoft.com slash home, right? And then you'll be seeing the Power BI interface, right? You can go to the account manager, which is basically the one show uh, your account details, and then you will be seeing start trial uh, link or the button for uh, you know, see Microsoft Fabric. If your admin has already enabled Microsoft Fabric to your tenant, then what you can do is you can, uh, uh, you know, start creating fabric items. Whenever you start creating a fabric item, you will be prompted for uh, fabric trial. You can simply accept it and continue. So that's how you start. Let me quickly show you how you can start with the trial and how you can explore the things related to Microsoft Fabric. Okay, I have opened app.fabric.microsoft.com, the URL I showed you the previous slide, and basically it's Power BI. So how do I know whether uh, Fabric is enabled or not? So basically, I should see a Power BI icon at the uh, bottom left side uh, if Fabric is enabled for me or my tenant or my workspace, all right? But I don't see anything like that. So what you have to do is, uh, you know, as we discussed, I can simply start the trial 
or else I can enable uh, Microsoft Fabric for the entire organization. Let, let me show you the way of uh, enabling Microsoft Fabric for the entire organization or uh, for certain set of uh, uh, people who are part of one of the security group. Okay. So what you have to do is you can simply uh, click on the setting icon and then you can find admin portal link. When you open admin portal link, you'll be seeing Microsoft Fabric preview uh, item. So if you expand it, you'll be seeing a checkbox. Basically, it says accept Microsoft default selection, which is off. You can uh, uh, unselect it and then you can enable it. But when you enable it, uh, rather than enabling it to the entire organization, it is always better to enable it for set of people. So what you have to do is you can simply create a security group uh, using Active Directory, okay, or even in 365 and then make sure you have added relevant people for that Active Directory and then come back to this interface, use that or add that uh, uh, security group to this, okay. That's how you enable this for the entire organization or for set of people. So let me open Azure portal and quickly uh, create the group. So I have already opened my Azure portal. I'm um, uh, you know, giving a name saying, let's say uh, the fabric user group, all right? And uh, that's all you have to do. Just give a name and then click on create to get the user group created or the security group created. And then you need to add uh, you know, one or more members to that, okay? So all these things can be done with Azure portal. Let me add myself to this group. Then I'll go back to the Power BI and use this group for enabling Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so now I can simply uh, enable again and then I'm going to select security, uh, specific security group and let me find the one I just created. It is there and I'm going to select it and click on apply. So remember, this is, you're not going to see the Power BI icon immediately. It will take some time. So as you see in the message, uh, it says about it takes about 15 minutes okay so so let's wait for 15 minutes and check let me refresh the page all right now i see a power bi icon at the uh, bottom left corner so i can see a uh, few items or else i can click on microsoft fabric for seeing the entire thing related to microsoft fabric i can see microsoft fabric page the things we discussed power bi data factory data engineering, data science, uh, or the, you know, real-time analytics, everything can be seen. Remember, uh, if you're going to start with the trial, you can get the Microsoft Fabric enabled to your My Workspace, okay? So that's something you can easily do. So all I have to do is just go to the uh, account manager and start the trial, okay? Let me show you the way of uh, starting the trial using the account manager. So when I click on the account manager, I can see the start trial. I can click on it. Then I'll be seeing this message. So I can click on start trial and then get all the items with Microsoft Fabric into my workspace. Or else if Microsoft Fabric has been enabled for organization or for set of security groups, another way of getting started with the trial is I can go to my workspace and then start creating uh, you know, one of the fabric items. Now see, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, click on the new button and then click on the, something related to fabric which is lake house so whenever i click on something like that i'm getting a message saying that, you know it creates the environment for microsoft fabric and i can start the trial okay so as you see it has been already uh, uh, created so i can click on ok and check my account manager again it says i can simply access it for 60 days or 59 days all right so this is how you start the trial now let's explore a few things and see all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, uh, uh, you know, multiple lake houses and then let's create folders and upload some files and see how all these things work. All right. So I'm in my workspace. I'm going to click on new. Uh, these are the items that can be created within my workspace, but I don't see everything. So I'm going to click on show all. So when I click on show all, I'll be seeing all the items, including fabric items. So lake house is one of the fabric items. I'm going to click on this. I'll be prompted for, uh, for for the lake house name. So I'm going to say lake house 100. Okay, that, that's how I'm going to name it. So let me click on create to get it created. And then I see my lake house 100 with the explorer. 
So I can see mainly two sections or two main folders, tables and files. We don't have anything with these two folders. I can create subfolders under files. For example, I can right click on it and then select new subfolder. Let me say customer. So it's, it's up to you. You can get, you can organize your one leg as you want. So this is going to be the one leg, all right? And I'm, I'm going to create another folder. Let's say product. I'm not going to upload files for all these folders. Uh, let's upload a file for one of the folders. Uh, let me create another folder called sales. Okay, so this is how you maintain or organize your uh, lake house 100 within your one lake account all right and if i want to upload a file i can simply click on this ellipsis button and then select upload and then upload files i can uh, click on this for accessing my file system and i can see my customer file and i'm going to click on upload so file is getting uploaded if i click on customer file i should uh, see the customer csv file all right and if i have installed one lake explorer okay i'll be able to see all these things within my file system and i can simply access this customer file and i can place some files into product and sales as well all right in addition to that i can refer external containers uh, to my lake house right i can simply uh, uh, you know add one of my data lake accounts to lake house 100 uh, as an external uh, data lake and you know once it is linked I'll be simply able to use all the content in that data lake account with my uh, fabric items, all right? But before that, let's explore the, uh, the items in my workspace now. Let me click on my workspace. So I can see the lake house account, right? This is lake house 100. In addition to that, I can see something called SQL endpoint, lake house 100 SQL endpoint. So if you want to access all the content uh, through SQL interface, you have to use this endpoint. Let's explore all these things later. Uh, uh, let me show you the way of adding an external uh, data lake into this. I can do it for the same lake house or else I can create a new lake house. Let me go back to new and then lake house. I'm going to say lake house 101. So I'm creating it, okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a folder called external data. All right, and then I can simply click on this ellipsis icon or the button again, and then say new shortcut. So I can see uh, three things for the shortcut, one lake, okay. I can simply refer another uh, lake house or another workspace, another tenant, all right, or else I can select data lake. You can see even Amazon S3 bucket can be simply integrated. All right. So let me select data lake and I'll be seeing uh, interface that accepts all the inputs it needs for uh, creating the link. So I need to get the, the URL or the endpoint for my uh, data lake account. It should be, uh, you know, with the dfs.co windows net URL. Okay. I'll, I'll show you the way of getting this URL. And it's always better to have the file system or the container name tag with this. So you're going to limit it for one of the containers, right? And then all you need is something like account key or the shared access signature or the service principle for accessing it, okay? Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on these things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the account key for this. But before that, let me open my Azure portal and access my data lake accounts. All right, I'm going to access one of my resource groups that have been created for demonstrations. All right, this is the one I'm going to access. This has multiple uh, storage accounts. Let me pick something like this. So this is the storage account. This is a data lake, right? And uh, uh, th there's a menu item called endpoints. So I'm looking for it. See, endpoints. I can click on it. And you can see multiple endpoints, but what I have to copy is the, the primary endpoints. Where is it? So data lake storage, primary endpoints. This is the one I have to copy with dfs.co.windows.net. So I'm going to copy this and then paste here. And I need the file system. Let me go back to my data lake, go to containers and copy this container name and place it here. All right, so the URL is uh, set and uh, 
I'm going to create a new connection and the connection name is going to be uh, I, I can simply say uh, don't want to see the whole thing for my uh, connection name so let me uh, set like this okay so that's going to be my connection name and I'm going to use account key all right let me go back and then select the account key as well access key copied go back and paste let me click on next so we should see a message saying uh, okay all good I didn't see any error message so I'm going to uh, name the shortcut name as uh, let's say adventure works files all right and let me click on create and I can see the folder now you can see it's a different icon if I click on it, I can see the folders inside that data lake file system and I can see files as well. Okay, so likewise, I can have multiple lake house accounts and then the place files as I want or load files using something like uh, data factory. Okay, uh, or I can simply do all these things using my file explorer in my Windows machine. Let me go back to my first lake house and what else we can do? Uh, there are a lot okay I can simply use notebooks for processing my data I can build the data warehouse against all the files I have placed I'll, I'll show you one more uh, things uh, you know how you can work with notebooks so if I want to access this customer uh, data set okay and if I want to get the data loaded to a data frame how can I do it I can click on open notebook I can select new notebook say I'm not going to create a cluster okay so everything is automated I'm using serverless compute environment for this so new notebook is getting created and I can see the cell all right now if I want to uh, you know write a Python code I can simply write but you know I can get certain codes uh, automatically written right if I want to get data from my uh, customer files and get it loaded to a data frame I can click on this ellipsis button then I can say load data using spark code see the code is already uh, written for me right and I'm going to say header is it is false because I don't have a header with this file and let me execute this and see it is getting executed okay so this is how you use Microsoft fabric a lot more to explore so let's check all of these things with multiple videos all right, we had a look on Microsoft Fabric and we explored few items. Uh, so that's all for this video and uh, let's see more with the next set of videos. Thanks for watching.